The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And he also said to the crowds, when you see a uh, cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it is going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky. But why do you not know how to interpret the present Time. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You hypocrites. <laughs> Rather strong language from Jesus, that godly person who brought the love of our New Testament God to humanity to replace the wrath of an angry Old Testament God. Yet here in our morning's gospel, we hear the anger and frustration in his voice as he calls out, you hypocrites. Scholars tell us that this phrase was perhaps introduced into the writing because it was frequently used in first century Palestine as words of abuse. As we would say today, you idiot. Or Archie Bunker might have said to Edith, you dingbat. <laughs> or you meathead to his son-in-law. But look at this section of our gospel story. Jesus tells those in attendance that they can read the skies and the winds and realize what the weather will be like. <clears throat> what he doesn't say is that they cannot seem to read his actions, his teachings, and realize who he really is why he was there among them. They just cannot seem to recognize the messianic age in which they are living, the present time. Jesus' audience, both then in the first century and now in 2022, like to hear his stories and parables. Then and now, People are impressed with his teachings, with his miracles, with his kindness to children and widows. But then, Jesus throws his listeners a curved ball. I'm a baseball freak, what can I tell you? He throws them a curved ball and says something unexpected, something found rather difficult to hear. I came to cast fire on the earth. There will be divisions in the houses, father against son, son against father. And we are uncomfortable hearing those harsh words, hearing those words coming out of the mouth of Jesus. And remember how he answered Mary, his mother, when he was 12 years old, and she was frantic looking for him on that annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem. 
when she and Joseph found him speaking with the scribes in the temple, he turned to them and he said, did you not know I was to be in my father's house? As a mother, I think that is quite a response from a 12-year-old who had caused so much fright to his parents. Whether that 12-year-old is in the beginning of that first century or in 2022. But I believe that that is exactly what Jesus intended to do, to make us uncomfortable here in our present time, just as his words would have done to his audience in that first century episode. Interestingly, this same discourse is found in the Gospel of Matthew. But Matthew eliminated those two words, you hypocrites. Different audience. When we look through the many discourses and soliloquies presented to us throughout the four Gospels, we find that there are many instances when Jesus proclaims ideas and comments that are very difficult for us to hear. Go sell all that you possess and give your money to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Are we supposed to take those words literally? Then there is another quote later on in the Gospel of Luke. A woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts that nursed you. And Jesus responds to her sounds, it sounds kind of insensitive. He turns and he says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it, period. Not one nice word was spoken by Jesus about his mother at that time and place. So what do we think these statements from Luke mean for our relationships with our families? And what could it mean about our relationships with each other? Jesus is very aware of his relationship with his heavenly father, Yahweh. Is he then saying our relationships on this earth, our human relationships cannot compare to our relationship with God? Perhaps. Perhaps Jesus uses these instances to interject a form of shock value in his teachings and preachings. You see, the folks back in those biblical times were just as stubborn as the folks are today. Some of us right here at Zion. So sometimes they and us, we meet at that jolt of reality to make us aware of what is happening right around us. So that is how I received this morning's gospel lesson. And just as we heard in last week's gospel, I remember last week's gospel, for there your treasure is, for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Yes, we do have loving relationships here on earth but remember, and this is the key, remember how much greater and more loving should our relationship be with our Heavenly Father. Now this is a special day for the church. On our church calendar, we commemorate the life of Jonathan Myrick Daniels. Anybody here know Jonathan Daniels? You've got an in, though, Alex. Jonathan was a seminarian from my alma mater, Episcopal Divinity School. And he was killed while registering African Americans in Alabama to vote back in 1965. He was working the area around Loudoun County as the first white civil rights person to be in that county encouraging 
the local folks to register and to vote, to have their voices heard. And as you can imagine, this really upset the local white supremacists and KKK members. They did not take kindly to people from the North coming into their territory and shaking up their status quo. Well, one day, while stopping at a local convenience store with some of the young African-American teenagers who were working with Jonathan, Jonathan pushed a young girl aside when one of the local men lifted his shotgun at her and fired. Jonathan took the bullet meant for the young Ruby Sales, and she died on the spot. The shooter was identified as Tom Coleman. Later, he was put on trial. He was acquitted of the shooting of both Jonathan and another white preacher. When interviewed after his acquittal, Mr. Coleman said that he would do it all over again. In 1980, Jonathan is recognized as a martyr in the chapel of saints and martyrs in England's Canterbury Cathedral. The only other 20th century American with this distinction is Martin Luther King Jr. Then in 1991, Jonathan Daniels was named a saint in the Episcopal Church calendar. So there is a happy ending to that story, isn't there? In an article published in our Washington Daily News last week, I wrote about saints as friends of God. And while alive, Jonathan gave up his Harvard graduate school education to go into ministry because he knew God called him to do so. Just by that action, by doing what God wanted him to do, that set Jonathan on the path to sainthood. I believe that if he had not died there in Alabama, he would have dedicated his life to serving others, to helping the downtrodden find their ways up. You see, Jonathan had the heart of a saint. He had the mindset of a saint. And he was willing to give his all for his God-given call to serve others. May God bless Jonathan and all those who follow the call to serve others. Amen.